Hi, this is Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Fabian Geierhalter. Fabian is a well-known brand strategist and is the founder of Finian, a consultancy based in Los Angeles that helps turn ventures into successful brands. Fabian is a popular speaker and mentor whose work has been featured in the Washington Post and the Huffington Post, and his book, How to Launch a Brand, was a number one Amazon bestseller. His uh, former client list includes startups like Jukin Media and Servios, I think I got that, I hope I got that pronunciation right, um, and well-established brands including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Warner Brothers, and Honeywell. In addition to writing How to Launch a Brand, Fabian is also the author of his latest book, Bigger Than This, how to turn any venture into an admired brand, which we'll be talking a little bit. We'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, you can follow Fabian on Twitter at Finian Insights and check out the Finian website at Finian F I N I E N dot com. In this interview, we're going to talk about uh, Fabian's background and career, um, professional interests, his books, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience writing. Uh, so, thank you, Fabian, for being on the Front Matter podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Len. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, uh, you've had a couple of, of stages in your career, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit first about uh, where you grew up. I grew up in Vienna, Austria, hence, uh, hence my peculiar name and my accent. <laughs> uh, and I was there for, well, I, I finished uh, high school there and then I moved to Switzerland for a year and a half to study communication design, which is really a fancy way of uh, saying graphic design, but I actually like communication design better because it kind of describes, describes um, you know, the service that you offer a client uh, in, a, in a better way because you communicate something. And uh, I was there for a year and a half, and then halfway through my studies, the college decided to close its beautiful Switzerland campus. And so gone, gone were my views of uh, the Avion water bottle-shaped mountains that I saw every morning. Um, and uh, off, off I was shipped uh, to the U.S. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I had about three weeks where they said, look, um, college is closing. We have our sister campus, the main campus in beautiful Pasadena um, in uh, Los Angeles. And then I moved to Los Angeles and I kind of sticked around ever since. And you, uh, you studied for a BFA at um, Art Center College of Design. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And what was that like? Did you, did you, I mean, for example, one thing I know from, you know, uh, I used to hang out with uh, artists um, and often they had a final show uh, at, in, at the end of their degree. Did you do something like that? You know, we had something like that um, when I was when I was studying there. It wasn't as elaborate as it, as it is now because now I'm on the on the other side of the um, of the coin, and now I'm actually uh, the industry that goes into the school looking at uh, you know um, uh, students' work, and they do a really great job now, and it's very much geared to future um, employers and uh, people kind of like do their five minute speed dating, you know. Type Type, uh, dog and pony show of their work and it's really cool i mean it's a, it's a, it's a great it's a great feature you know for for artists but but especially when you're a commercial artist like a product designer or a graphic designer for you to actually meet people from the industry and already have the first ins while you're still on your final days of uh, of college it's a, it's a really cool thing to do and uh what was the um it must have been an interesting shift uh moving to California. Yes, rather so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, especially coming from, from Switzerland, and I, I kid you not when I, when I talk about this, you know, Lake Geneva and these beautiful vineyards and, you know, the snow covered mountains and everything is very, very, very quiet and very pristine. And then suddenly, uh, you're you're thrown out at uh, LAX and you try to uh, get through traffic and you know back then I mean this this dates me I mean this shows pretty much uh, how um, you know how old I am but uh, we had like those Macintosh computers that were those 9100s and they were I mean they were they were big monsters and then the monitors were just as wide as they were deep um, so it took me about three weeks to get all of my stuff shipped over and then to carry that over to the apartment and stuff it was just a pretty big deal but yeah it was a culture shock as big as a culture shock could, could most probably be you know and uh, it was uh, language wise it wasn't a problem but uh, but yeah I mean you know just imagine you don't have a social security number you don't have a driver's license you have no place to stay so you're just staying in a seedy motel 
hotel just to kind of like you know like be on a student budget and and you get you get to witness life you know in in the u.s very quickly um but after after a couple of months you know i i i adjusted yeah it's interesting i've i've uh i've been to geneva um and i i've never really quite thought booted up the sort of contrast in my mind between that and, and like <laughs> la um uh it's really interesting um and and so you're, it's interesting you're talking about the the technology you had um uh did you was was digital design a part of your course yes so so um that actually happened right when i started my study so i graduated in 97 so in in 94 that was kind of like right at the verge where everything was already digital we still did some things um in in the traditional way which is like typesetting and things like that which actually is, is, is it was great that i was able to witness that you know because then for a good uh, 10 15 years um, it was all digital only digital and now with this whole revival and with the current zeitgeist of going retro and going hands on and you know artisanal you know like now uh, most art colleges actually have typesetting programs again where you actually get your hands dirty and you have to like you know use type press and you know things like that but it's it's really good to understand the origins and understand how something is actually done by hand and then use the computer um and uh you know these days you know a lot of kids when they self-learn um you, you can tell typography very quickly <laughs> you know apart from from someone that actually goes through um training like arts at the college of design or someone that is kind of like self-trained that being said um this could start a whole discussion about college and this it worth it and uh, the educational system in the u.s and i don't know if we have that much time <laughs> well, so actually that's actually really interesting um one of the sort of unofficial themes of uh this podcast is um i i often because most lean pub authors are actually sort of software developers or people in you know software architects and people who work for tech firms um i i always try to take the opportunity to ask them you know if you were starting out now would you formally study uh, computer science in university, or would you just strike out on your own? Um, and actually, this is a really good opportunity for me to ask you that that question. But in in design, uh, what would what would you if you were starting out now? Would you take the same uh, course of sort of formal study, or would you recommend to yourself that you do something more independent? It's a pretty big question because I mean, look the, the way the way that things ended up for me, the the path that I took or the path that kind of like you know shaped itself in front of me, it it, it worked out really well. So I believe that everything happened for a really good reason. Now. I am I am not a big fan of the current educational system, and I'm not a big fan of getting uh, getting students into huge amounts of debt with a lot of um, you know educational curriculum that does not necessarily lend itself to the real world, right? So, I I am really really torn. Right. And if I would have if I would have kids that would uh, be college age, I would have a really hard time pushing them towards a college education. And I would have equally as hard of a time figuring out what else. Right. Like, how do I actually you know, how, how can they shape their own way without with still having a really solid foundational education in their expertise without only just you know starting on the very bottom in their job it's a, it's a really it's a really difficult question and i think that's why you know the government and everyone is struggling with how to how to deal with that but uh, i'm a big big fan of all of these you know startups and entrepreneurs that come out and say hey you know like here's another way that you can learn and here's my five cents of how you can learn and and i mean i i love that i mean i'm i'm trying to mentor as much as i can you know, personally as well, um, just because I think that there's the, the current system is definitely not the best way forward. Yeah, it's interesting. A, 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 a point seems to have been turned um, with respect to, you know, it's like a difference in not just degree, but kind with the expense of getting a degree, particularly in the United States. I had a colleague with um, three college age children, and just for one of them, he was paying $60,000 a year for Harvard tuition. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at that point, like his life changed a lot. Um, fortunately, he, he could he could afford it, but it was by living a different way um, and basically working all the time. 
Um, and I mean, you know, sorry, but any, anything for your kids, right? I mean, that that kind of idea that you know, like you, you know, you, you're you're a father, and and this is this is kind of like your calling, and you need to do this for your kids. Um, that's absolutely that that's a that's a noble way of doing it. But he most probably did it for for the happiness of of the son or the daughter. But he didn't, you know, he didn't do it for to support colleges, right? So it's kind of like mm-hmm. it's it's a fine line of how do you how do you get your kids to actually understand if it needs to be a college education or you know again what other what other ways are there um so i'm not sure if the 60k are really are really necessary these days but it's so difficult and i'm i'm not a dad so i'm you know i've I've got a very easy talk here (laughs) i I don't have to go home and then actually figure it out (laughs) um and uh you uh ended up getting i I believe I, i read a story where you you got a green card um after graduating i imagine um, and then you started your own design studio. Yeah, you, it, it happened actually a little bit later. So when when you study when you study as a foreigner in the U.S. and you you get a certain visa, I believe it is a J one visa, um, which is a student visa. Uh, don't quote me on the J one aspect. Uh, I think that's what it's called. At least that's what it used to be called. Um, and then everything is a little bit easier because you're kind of already in, you know, like you're already in the states. Um, but in order for you to get an internship, I think it's okay for you to do that. But then in order for you to actually work work, um, an employer needs to sponsor you. And that's the big story in uh, Silicon Valley right now. And especially uh, given the, 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 the Trump era that we're in right now, um, it's, it's, it's getting more and more difficult, right? And so I got, uh, I was lucky enough to have an employer who uh, sponsored me, which means they basically have you with a carrot, right? So you're just you're just waiting until you get the green card because they sponsor it and they know they kind of have you at least working for them until that green card hits in. So it's kind of like a mutual thing that everyone knows. Okay, the minute the minute that he or she gets the green card, who knows what's going to happen? But at least we're going to have that, um, you know, that employee until that moment. And that's what happened with me. Like the minute the green card hit in, I'm like, adios. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, and then I was freelancing all the time, so I was I was always eager to um, to work with a uh, you know with multiple clients at a time, and you know, and not necessarily. Be employed uh, and and go more the self-employed route and so you did you did open your own your own studio yeah it was it was literally a studio i mean i was i was living in venice uh california which is you know which at the time was you know it was it was super um you know trendy and hip but right on the verge of being gentrified meaning there were definitely drug deals happening in the alley behind my studio and there, there was there was shady stuff going on right and left um and i remember when i had my first em- Employee who actually was uh, was was my first intern. Um, she was still working in a in a place where I had a cat running around. I had like a bathtub in the corner. You know, like it was like a living working kind of situation, and it was super uncomfortable. Um, I'm sure for her, uh, she's a she's a big wig at Google now, so I'm sure she can tell all the stories. Uh, but she actually turned into my first um, employee, and then uh, she turned into my first senior, and she kind of like grew with me for a couple years, and we had a great office then on Main Street and Santa. Monica and things, uh, things, uh, things happened pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, and what, what do you mean by that, that things happened quickly? I, mean, I, I know that it eventually grew to be um, um, nearly a couple of dozen employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, you know what happens when you're when you're young and naive and, you know, like have a big designer ego and you just want to get a lot of people working for you and have a lot of amazing clients and win a lot of awards. I was just I was just happily, um, you know, employing one person after another. Right. Like just get a lot of cool people together and create cool stuff. Um, And the problem is in the graphic design industry, it's very it's it's very demanding. Right. I mean, it's not it's not your usual nine to five. Usually, you know, like you stay late and it's, it becomes more of like a family environment. Um, and once once I grew the company to about 10 people, it became really, really tough for me to to not micromanage and then to actually be able to afford middle management, so to speak, and project managers and to kind of like get from that um, from that big group of, you know, of, of, of people who just happen to work for me. Um, but it, it really felt like a big group of, you know, graphic designers working together um, to to turn into a very professional you know company that that has all of the right uh, foundational elements which 
as a, as a creative, it's really, really difficult to, to have the right brain and the left brain say, hey, let's hang out. <laughs> let's, let's see how we get through this together. And I think that was that was always uh, my my struggle. And then at some point, um, uh, a good uh, 13, 14 years into it, uh, I, I kind of said, you know what, I have to really rethink, uh, rethink if, if this kind of company is the right, if, if this really makes me happy, right? Yeah, and um, and uh, you decided that uh, the way you were doing things didn't make you happy, and you you made a really big change, um, as I understand it, to uh, basically um, closing up shop uh, and starting a new a new company. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm I'm impressed how much you researched me <laughs> because I I don't I don't write about this too too frequently. But yeah, I mean it's it's an intriguing story I think for for a lot of entrepreneurs because here here I was and I had kind of an agency name that that was recognized at least you know in certain you know in certain fields and I, I won a lot of awards and and had ongoing clients that all paid us you know like nice monthly um, you know retainers. And yet I was not perfectly happy. You know, it's like financially, I was not exactly where I wanted to be. And, um, you know, as far as like the group dynamic, I always felt like everyone needs to get raises. And, you know, how, how do I make ends meet with still getting high quality work? Um, there was a lot going on where I just felt like, you know what, let's 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 just see if I can uh, flip this around. And I, I actually hired a consultant uh, who came in and all he does is he does this one thing and that's all he does. And it, it's just so cool. All he does is he goes to small struggling graphic design agencies and he most probably tells them pretty much uh, the same thing, all of them. And he basically just tells each one of them, look, you have to specialize. You have to do one thing, have to do it really well. And you have to have one target audience and one type of clientele. And and then you're going to excel because everyone wants to hear that one message. And it's actually so interesting because I, on the one hand, I say what he did was so easy, quote unquote. But on the other hand... I learned so much from him about how to how to actually yeah, how branding works because what he did with me I'm now applying to to some of my clients um, you know that that singular voice and message and something that's very intrinsic to you and what you do really well and you know that that can be applied to a Fortune 100 brand as, as well as a you know as, as a one person shop and so so yeah and, and we decided that day that uh, that I'm going to change my agency into a very very small um, consultancy that is specialized in only working with, um, you know, very early stage and type of like early stage companies, which means like series A type companies that, uh, that, that just start up and like creating their foundation. What is the brand about? You know, what, what should the name be? What should the identity be? What do we stand for? Um, and, and, and that's what I did. And it was a huge, it was a huge deal, you know, because I told my wife, I'm like, look, we're moving, we're moving from Malibu to Long Beach, which, you know, is still the harbor city of, uh, of Los Angeles. And, uh, and, you know, let's, let's bootstrap for a year or two, because I really want to make this big change. And I invested a lot of, a lot of money and time into, you know, writing my first book at that time, um, via Lean Pub as well, um, how to launch a brand. And in that book, I actually described the process that my consultancy was about to do. So it was a very interesting way. It's like, I figured if I write it down, I, I have to stick to it, you know, and it has to be tr the truth, right? Because if I publish it, I can't go back. And so that was kind of like the foundation of my consultancy. I wanted to ask you, there's actually one, one detail of that transition that you made that um, struck me was um, you talk about how you paid this consultant, I believe it was $10,000 um, mm -hmm. for, for one day. Um, and, um, uh, it, it just reminded me of an experience I had in the past where, um, I used to be an investment banker. Um, and, um, at one point we were sort of forced to hire a very famous, um, strategy consultancy. And we paid this team of people a lot of money to basically write what we told them to. And when they were done, <laughs> we threw it out. <laughs> uh, we put it, we put it right in the garbage bin because it was, it was all part of a wider strategy to have their name involved in the process. Yeah. Um, but who they really were and what they were actually saying was meaningless to us. But the other experience I had with, you know, doing air quotes consultants was if you can get someone who really, really knows their area and what they're doing, it's worth thousands of dollars for a couple hours of their time. 
So everything you said is absolutely correct, right? So, and, and <clears throat> you know, obviously I, I myself am now a consultant, which, you know, it just hurts every time I say the word, but but I am a consultant and I, I, I came to terms with that. Um, yeah, consultants, I mean, look, it, there's, there's immediately a high fee associated with them because it's also positioning, right? I mean, if you're not expensive, how could you possibly be good, right? Um, and I always make that comparison of like, you know, there's, there's very often, Often it is the case that when you get your, let's say you have an old Volvo station wagon, right? Um, and you want to get your old Volvo station wagon, you know, quickly fixed up, or you want to get, you know, like whatever engine check or something, you just go to whatever, you know, Choshmo, you know, mechanic around the corner, you know, and you just get it done for cheap. But if you if you go up to, to Whistler, or you go up to the mountains with your family in your old Volvo station wagon, and you say, you know what, I'd better get it up, you know, bring it up to up to speed. Speed, you go to a Volvo dealer and they do the exact same work with the same mechanic that most probably moved from the small shop around the corner over to work for Volvo now. <laughs> the, the same work, the same everything, but it suddenly costs like $1,800 instead of like, you know, 120 And it might be the same person working on it, you know, that's just moving from one garage to another. So there's something about that peace of mind um, that, that people buy into. And that was the case with your, you know, with, with the example that you gave where in the end, the consultancy said the exact same thing for like, you know, 20, 50, 60 thousand dollars. But all they needed is that stamp of approval from that consultancy name so that the upper management can move forward and actually make that big change. And, you know, in front of the board of directors, point the finger at, well, you know, McKinsey said so or whoever. Right. So it's, it's kind of like how it how how it works. Um, and, and sometimes I'm the beneficiary of that. But you know what? I don't get much joy out of it when it's like, well, we just need you. We just need you there because we need the consultant and, you know, you've got the right kind of like background to make it count. <laughs> and, that's, and that's not very fulfilling, right? Yeah, I can imagine that, that, that that's not very fulfilling. But, it, it is, <laughs> but at the same time, it, it, it actually can be. I mean, I, I was sort of being c- cynical, but it, it it's actually can be very it's a very important role sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes you need a, a sort of figure that's external um, to what your business is doing to just simply be there as another voice. That is true. And I mean, one <clears throat> one thing is for sure that if I get hired by a company that makes me repeat their statement, basically, right, I, I if I don't look eye to eye with that, and if I don't think that that is really the right way forward for the company, I would not do it. And I... I'm I'm well known to have uh, to have uh, I wouldn't say the word fired, but to have let go clients, you know, halfway through the project when I said, look, this is just not, you know, ethic ethically, that's just not working for me. And and most people do understand it, you know. Yeah, that's got to be a, a very interesting, you know, I'd say interesting position position to find yourself in. But um, uh, it I I did read a couple of references that you when in your writing to to firing clients. Um, that must be, I, I imagine sometimes they're shocked. Yeah, all the time they're shocked. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, it's so, it's so weird in business how things, how people take things personally, but, but, but it's really not personal, right? It's just, it's just kind of like a, a code of conduct, right? I mean, if, if all these large fortune 500s would ever read their codes of conduct, I'm sure there's something about it in there. Right. And, and I feel like the beauty of me being a consultancy where I have one full timer and, you know, like a, like a part-time assistant who I never met in person, but she's, she's lovely. And I send her gifts, you know, for Christmas and, you know, everything is good. Um, is that I am completely free to work with the type of clients that I want to work with and and work on exactly the type of projects I want to work with. And that to me is, as far as my work life goes, that to me is is so absolutely exciting. You know, because you, you just wake up in the morning and when you say, you know what, why are you stressed out? What is bugging you? What is that thing? And then, you know, you, you realize, oh, it's because of this one client, because things are not going the right way and it's losing kind of like its grip. And, and you know, then, then you know you need to do something about it. And I'm not saying you get to immediately fire a client, but, but you talk, right? <laughs> you communicate, you figure things out. Um, I've got a couple of questions about uh, what it is, what it is your, your day is like and, and what your work is like. There's a certain kind of 
uh, glamour associated with things like design and um, branding consulting and things like that. And I'm just uh, thinking one of my favorite shows these days is Blackish. I don't know if you've if you've seen that show, um, but I. I, I heard of it. Yeah, I'm 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 horrible with uh, with catching shows while they're still hot. So um, okay. yeah, <laughs> well, I, I recommend giving it a try. Um, but it, it it's it's interesting because it features a, a main character who works at a um, advertising agency, um, and uh, of course it's a, it's a comedy. So you know you don't really they sort of make a joke about how they don't actually do any work. Um, but, um, I know that you do, um, and so I'm just wondering what, what's it like? I mean, so for example, uh, you know, are you brought into a, a, a startup and they say, you know, help us with our brand and then you give them a presentation? I mean, how, how does the nitty gritty work out? Yeah, so and I mean, so advertising agencies that's that's always very exciting, right? Uh, I'm sure you caught Mad Men back in the day. Um and and that's kind of like that's the that's the heyday, right? Um the thing with advertising agencies is that um and and with graphic design agencies is that it's it's very much a red race, right? It's like a client is usually right and uh clients usually get to see 5000 pieces of creative until they decide on one of them and very often at the end the creative is really Really lukewarm because the client had so many, so many stakeholders that that kind of like took everything away from it that made the creative exciting. Um, so, also another reason why I have the small consultancy now is because I like. I like to to have a process, uh, and maybe that's my German accent too that already gave that away. But I, I'm very process oriented, so um, especially with startup entrepreneurs at that time, they're very small teams, right? I mean, sometimes it's literally one person, sometimes it's two, three people. Um, they really, they, usually, they don't understand the power of branding and how important it is to a startup. Um, some of them, rightfully, you know, so because they they pivot and they change, you know, what they're really in the business for. And so, if they in the beginning spend a lot of money or any money really creating their brand, and then you know the startup is actually changing after a couple of years or a couple of months down, then then it is a then it is a bad investment. Um, but what I do is I come in and I just tell them, look, branding is not about it's not about your logo. Um, it's really even though the logo is an important aspect still, especially today with apps and, you know, like there's so much visual clutter. It, it You need something that stands out. But it is important that you actually understand what you stand for and what kind of, you know, what, what, what the reason for being of the company is and why people would care about the company more so than the product, like what's behind the company. And, you know, I mean, look at lean pub, right? Lean pub to, to, to the, to the end consumer, it's a download, right? And then, um, to an author, it's, it's a very liberating tool, um, to, to do something that they can do themselves. And, and, and then behind the brand, the whole story of the founder and, and kind of like that that movement and the talks that he gives and right that then becomes really the DNA of the brand. Like that's like the reason for being right. That that's kind of like his you know foundational um, you know monologues about you know this is why we this is why Lean Pub needs to exist. But so the, this kind of like this pyramid of like what people see at what point in their journey and then how much of that do they actually feel subliminally while while they're at Lean Pub, that's what gets me really excited. So when I go into um, to answer your to answer your question, to go back to the question, um, when I work with uh, startup entrepreneurs, I say, look, I do brand strategy, and it's super important. It's the most important thing, but I do it in one day. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, you know, I'm kind of like the consultant who came into my office. You know, I charge a good six, seven thousand um, dollars, you know, and, and it's one day and it's in their office or it's in my office. So meaning if you're an entrepreneur in China, I'm happy to fly over to you if you pay for it or you can fly over to me. But we have to be eye to eye. I don't do Skype. We have to sit there together for eight hours. And that's the minimum. It might run into 10 hours. And we work the strategy of the company, of the brand we work it out together you and I or you plus you know seven eight people right like all of us in one room um, and it's amazing what it does 
Because in the end, and, and you hinted at that before when you said, you know, consultants very often just repeat what you say. Well, th that's, kind of, that's kind of what a great consultant does. A great consultant listens. It's like a good therapist, right? Um, or, or great friends, right? It's, it, it's funny, like the less, you, the less you talk when you see a friend and the more that the friend talks, the more the friend catches up with you afterwards saying, it was so great talking with you. Like, this was so great. And I'm like, well, I didn't say a thing, right? But that's that's exactly why. That's why. That's why they love it because they just need to talk and they need to get it out there. And so I see. I see brand stra strategy very much like like brand therapy. It's like let's really get let's really get everything out of you. Like what your deepest you know reasoning is behind creating this company. And you could do so much. Why do you do this? And why do you think ten years from now? How would people remember that company if it goes kaput in ten years from now? Like what would that feeling be? That, that void that, that would be there if your company would suddenly be gone. So I actually write memorial speeches, you know, for, for startup founders, brands, even though the brands haven't been launched yet, right? So it's like, it's, like, it, it's, it's very interesting. I think it's, I, it, there's a lot of psychology in it. And, and I mean, that's what branding and advertising is in the end, right? Yes, there's the logo. Yes, there's the name. It all has to work together. But that foundational element is super exciting to me. Yeah, it's one of the things I found striking. Um in your work researching for this interview was the sort of very straightforwardness uh, with which you um, express the fact that you have to have a reason for what you're doing uh, in order to succeed, um, which seems like such a straightforward thing to say, but it really makes you realize, you know, that this isn't necessarily a question that people are asking themselves when they get up in the morning or when they go to work, or even when they launch their startup. I mean, what, what is it for? It's so bizarre, right? Because you would think that would be the first thing that, especially a startup founder, that they would have all of that like inside of them. And they're like, well, here's a reason why the world needs me right now. And here's why I start a company. But very often when they're at that point where they actually release a product or release a service or hire people or get funding, and they actually need to face the public and they need to have the right name and the right messaging and the right logo and the right, you know, you know, I call it the brand aura, right? Like everything that's around them visually and verbally that needs to convince people to buy the product they have such a hard time going right back into like that you know into the shower or the bedroom or whenever they woke up or like they had this big epiphany and they're like this is it the world needs me now you know it's like a superman cave thing it's like, cave thing it's like it doesn't it doesn't happen anymore and and then it's one thing to say well this is what we stand for but then you need to really carefully make sure that that what you stand for as a company that it perfectly aligns with your particular audience with your future employees with your partners founders right it it has to be this thing of like if these are our values do the do the values perfectly align you know and and i'm not saying shift your values and don't be true to yourself but make sure that you voice it in a way where people can where you can build this tribe as they call it you know yeah it's interesting it's interesting when you talk about um connecting with the audience and that that reminded me of something um that you wrote about how things have changed in the last you know let's say 10 years with with social media because you're you're you can connect with your audience but your audience can have a life of its own in a way that that it actually didn't in the past because uh people can project uh, their their voices uh, into this social media universe in a way they couldn't in the past. And it reminded me of how, um, you know, it used to be, if kids kids these days might not know, but it used to be that you could have a negative interaction with uh, an employee at a restaurant or something like that, uh, which is something that almost never, at least in my experience, doesn't really happen anymore uh, because of Yelp um, and yep. things like that. And so I was just, I wanted to ask you a little bit about 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 you know, how, how maybe that that's changed in your work over time with this emergence of, you know, you, you really have to be very careful in a way that you perhaps didn't have to be in the past. So this is interesting, right? I mean, this is, this goes right down to the, to the heart of it, right? It, 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 you say you have to be careful and that's exactly in my eyes that the perfect example of when you assume 
that companies would lie to you, <laughs> right? Because you have to be careful, right? So, so what, what the new brands do, the 2.0 brands today that actually understand that it's all about solidarity and transparency and you know what, whatever we do, the beauty is millions of people might immediately hear about it, um, but the, the problem is we, we cannot fake it anymore. So I feel like, I feel like it used to be um, you know, advertising-based communications, and now it's human-based communications. You know, now it's like, well, here's someone sitting writing social media for a brand. Well, guess what? The person that receives that social media from the brand knows exactly that there's someone sitting there writing it that's hired by the brand to do that. And that, that that person, you know, like is a real person typing, that it's not a bot, and that that person needs to to perfectly humanly convey what the brand feels about anything really i mean any weird question that 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 you put out there on social media that is being seen by the public needs to be answered because you know like it's it's hanging there so someone from the company needs to answer it and isn't it fascinating that all of this happens at the same time of the me too movement and of the trump uh, and pre- and brexit and you know like like it, it is just a really bizarre time where everyone is aching for you know transparency in in with brands but then with with everything around them you know it it just gets uncovered that that things are getting less and less transparent and you know and more and more closed up and uh you know and censored in a way so so it's a really it's a fascinating it's a fascinating time right now and fascinating not necessarily in the in the most <laughs> positive you know yeah that that's interesting that, that reminds me of an um uh, and sort of argument I've had with friends over the years where for me personally, you know, the, the Amazon um, grocery store that's now open to the public in Seattle where you can walk in and get what you want and walk out without interacting with the person unless you want to, um, that's my dream come true. Um, and to, <laughs> and to, a lot of people, to a lot of people, that's a nightmare. Um, uh, they, they love the, the interacting with the cashier and stuff like that. But but it reminds me that at the same time, what the way Amazon is presenting this technology is that it's freeing up the staff to genuinely help you um, yeah. rather than kind of, you know, you put something in front of them and they pick it up and swipe it over something and then give it back to you to put in a bag. Um, uh, and, and yeah, there's this interesting interplay um, with, you know, I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to get at, but, you know, the, the idea that, you know, we've got all this burgeoning technology that's actually helping us spend more time with each other uh, at the yeah. same time is there's a countervailing narrative that it's, it's, it's all isolating us. Uh, and at the same time as we're all open and we all have to be nice to each other at the same time, we've got, you know, Trump. Um. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In one word. And, and I mean, you know, the, the question is uh, back to your Amazon grocery story. I don't know who is lonelier, you know, I don't know who is lonely, the, the, the actual cashier who has to like, you know, just get the barcodes, you know, over the counter, or you as a person who walks through and never wants to talk to a person, you know, are you lonelier? Or is the person lonelier that is so excited that he or she actually gets to talk to a cashier? Right. Like all three have a different different kind of like, you know, feeling of loneliness about them. And in the end, it's all about how 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 the world is progressing. And I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I want to walk in and I don't want to pay. I don't want to think about credit cards and, and, and purses and like, you know, and, and cash. And I mean, God, no. Right. Like, I don't want to think about that. And. I, I wrote a I wrote a um, piece about the Amazon bookstore because I was so fascinated by that, and I know Amazon is a favorite topic for Lean Pub. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I wanted to ask you about that. I, I read that I read that article, and it was really interesting. Um, so you went you went to one of these Amazon bookstores, um, and I was wondering if you could just talk about what that experience was like. Well, so so it happened that one of those, um, you know, opened up in Los Angeles and it was right about the time where I finished my last book. And I, I felt it would be, you know, crazy not to at least see how how people in the future, you know, like will will, you know, consume books and how does Amazon rate books? And could my book ever be on the shelf there? You know, like like can I can I bootstrap that? Can I can I hack it? Right. Um, and and so, so that, that was my reasoning to, to, to walk in there. And 
I thought that the whole thing would be so, you know, like emotionless and so cold and so I just thought the whole thing would be really awkward. So I was I was super excited to slam Amazon for what they're doing. Um, and what happened was exactly the opposite. Um, they used the data that they get from online purchases and they use it in a way in the store that I just wish Barnes and Nobles would have thought of because they would have had all of that. Like they have the actual infrastructure to roll this out, but they're just always a little bit behind it. And it and it and it breaks my heart because I, I I just love for them to actually do these things. But what Amazon does is you walk in and you're in LA, so it says here are the top ten mo- you know most read books in LA, and you're like, well that's super interesting. And if I see it on a website, it doesn't do anything to me, right? But if I'm in a bookstore physically and I see here are the top ten most read books in LA I'm like wow and here are LA specific books I'm like well that's interesting and then here are books that just came on our shelf um, shelves in the last uh, couple of days and there are books that, there's like the Simon Sinek book with like 10,000 Amazon reviews next to a book by by some other consultant an entrepreneurial you know business book that has three you know uh, three uh, reviews you know, and, and, you're, and I'm like, wow, I mean, this is amazing that they are not just taking the best sellers and, you know, they're actually they're actually trying out what books stick in the store. And if the, the best feature is like, if you like this, you, you would like this. Right. I mean, that's like Amazon's claim to fame online. They used it in the store in such an in such an amazing way where they have these these, you know, uh, novels, you know, like the, the top 100 books of all times. And it basically says, well, if you like this book, you're going to like this and you're going to like this and you're going to like this. But now you grab the book and you can actually flip through it and you're like, oh, wow, I'm more this person. Let me walk over there. That's more like it. So you don't feel like a machine funnels you to who you, who they think you are, who the machine thinks you are, but you yourself can actually kind of like, you know, be in charge of your funnel. And I, I felt that was super interesting. I was in the store for maybe an hour, and I don't know when that happened the last time in a, in a Barnes & Noble. Yeah, that's that's actually a really interesting um, uh, observation there because uh, the there's a there's a there's I mean a whole cottage industry um, in in the public in the book publishing world around you know the value of independent bookstores and stuff like that and we, what you were saying reminded me of a, I think there's a, a line that made me laugh in your article about where you contrasted the benefits of like a list of staff picks. Um, which is a conventional thing Mm -hmm. versus feedback from millions of people. Um, (laughs) And and often what happens in the, in the indie book kind of cottage industry world, people say, Oh, instead of just some inhuman Amazon machine recommending something to you uh, and slurping up your data, um, we've got a person at the store who knows you personally, who can tell you, what you should be reading next. Uh, and to me, that's, that's, that's some kind of strange, first of all, no, uh, how, how could it possibly be that the random person randomly employed at the random shop owned by some random person could possibly tell me better than I know myself what I should be reading. And, and there's just this weird thing where like, there's this kind of paradox where people think they relate to what Amazon is doing as kind of impersonal, but what you led me to, think about it from a different direction, which is actually it's millions and millions of people that I'm interacting with via their, their technology and the way they're using it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I always find it very peculiar when I go into a shop and I, and I love indie shops, right? So, so I think you and I both, right. It's not, it's not the idea that, you know, like there is no, there's no merit in having them, but, but the way that the way that they just refuse to move forward, you know, is, is really, is really painful. I mean, the idea that I walk into a store and I see that, uh, Lisa recommends this book and it's Lisa's pick. It doesn't do anything to me. The same thing in a music store. And and I'm like old school vinyl, you know, I guess I'm cool again because it's retro now, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a vinyl collector. And so I go into stores and suddenly there are these random bins that say, here's Mark's, you know, like Mark's picks. And I'm like, 
I don't even know what type of music Mark likes. I don't know how old Mark is. I, I don't know Mark. Why would I go through that bin? And, you know, and, and that's kind of like that, that thing with Amazon, like you said. It's 10,000 people that liked, you know, um, Simon Sinek's book. They will now like Fabian Geilhalter's book. You know, th- that is not what they say, but that's what I say. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's like then it's like, oh, well, maybe I should give this strange Austrian author, you know, a chance and actually read this book. That, that makes sense to me. Right. So it's it's very different. Speaking of uh, the subject of your books, moving on, I guess, to the next part of the interview um, in how to launch a brand. You write about a brand platform um, and for any sort of, you know, startup people or, or people in business of any kind listening. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what a brand platform is and how one goes about building and maintaining one. So, you know, the brand platform is very much what I refer to um, earlier to when I come in and I do this one day, you know, like strategy workshop. And for for entrepreneurs, um, there's obviously a huge amount of entrepreneurs that are so bootstrapped that they that they just, you know, painfully pay 10 bucks for a book and that's about the brand strategy that they're going to do um and and for them i wrote this book to just understand you know what are some of these exercises that i go through with my clients and some of them they can bootstrap you know it's like a brand platform is really it's also called a brand foundation so it's really the idea that you know if you think of your company as, as a house and it's kind of like that footprint and it's the blueprint of you know like this is this is the architecture that could be built on it but this is exactly the foundation I need to lay right now in order for the for the architecture to fit on top of it so the idea with a company is you need to have that that foundation be you know made for a skyscraper and perfectly earthquake safe and go go way deep down right and be really strong so that whatever happens with your company in the next you know 10 years that that the foundation can hold it right like that it that it is put on on a foundation that has a very clear brand definition a very clear positioning statement like why are you in the business what do you really give your consumers um what are the pain points that you alleviate what are the benefits um have your core values figured out you know and core values is one of those things where it can go it can go bad very quickly right when when the core values are cheesy and no one can believe them and they feel like any company can say them but what are really core values that you as a founder already know that that's what you want the company to 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 stand for right and that's like that's like apples think different right i mean that's very much a core value of apple right like that's that's who we are or who we were right but that's something that the company can definitely build a good 10 years on even though it was a tagline but that could have been that perfect kind of core value so a brand platform is like an it's like you know a couple of these exercises that that you need to go through as a founder or as a founding team and answer really truthfully and very very intellectually you know like to really say like this is we really stand behind this um, and we can honestly build a company upon that you know foundation and from there you start the marketing and from there you start naming the company and from there you start giving uh, the company uh, the visuals, the logo, and everything else. And and in the in the book, how to launch a brand, I'm kind of going through these steps, and I also go into the naming, which you know. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty big deal as well. You know, it's like, how do you name a company? You know, how do you go about it? How do you not screw it up and get sued? Or how do you, you know, how do you make sure that you own the social media uh, channels and, and the dot com if, if, you know, if you want to own that, right? And, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, 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 um, that reminds me of an interesting um, uh, story from branding from uh, the, I moved to, I moved to the UK in the late nineties. Um, and shortly after I moved there, uh, there was this big, huge renaming of giant corporations, sort of rebranding trend that was happening. And for example, the Royal Mail, which was this incredibly popular brand renamed itself consignia um, <laughs> for about a minute after the country <laughs> went crazy. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. How, how can one avoid making catastrophic mistakes like that with naming 
Well, I mean, for Royal Mail, the catastrophic mistake was a renaming mistake, right? Not the, not the actual naming mistake, but that was just that I, you know, it was most probably the, the wrong consultancy at the wrong time saying, hey, the best way that we're going to reshape the idea of sending mail in the digital age would be to change the name, <laughs> which, which is not true. Really, I mean, I, I don't know anything about that story. You know, I, I have absolutely no idea what happened there, but it happens over and over and over with companies where they feel like in order for them to be seen differently by, by the public and by the target audience that they need to change the name or change the logo and very often this is a very it's a, it's a very fine line that they walk because of the brand legacy right and we've seen it with Gap when about 10 years ago or so or 8 years ago uh, they did the big uh, uh, Gap uh, logo rebranding and it was a huge disaster and so I'm still in complete shock that yesterday during the Grammys they had an advertising called uh, Gap logo remix where they basically showed all of the logos that they ever had and I thought it was very peculiar that they did that after, after having a big uh, branding uh, problem you know just a couple of years back, but to you know, to, to to the idea of how do you make sure that it doesn't happen in the get go? Like, how do you lay that foundation for a great name? Well, the big thing is you, you just it, it's a little bit it's a little bit science and, and it's a little bit art, right? Um, you have to make sure that on the one hand the name convey something and even if it doesn't convey something immediately you have a great story to tell about how the name came about right it can't be trendy because a name has to stick with you forever right it's kind of like a little bit the royal mail versus consigno or whatever whatever that name was right it has to it can't be something that just feels like that hot new name it has to be a name just like a logo a logo shouldn't be super modern it's not a marketing thing you know it can't it can't you know be not modern in two years from now it needs to it needs to be timeless so create that and then think about all the different languages that your customer audience uh, that your audience uh, speaks and most of the time that means in today's age it has to be extremely international you know how can it be pronounced in south korea you know like can you can you say certain certain you know letters and and can you put a word together you know that that your brand can can stand for and so there's a lot of it that's the science part where you just have to check off a lot of lists right and do a lot of like online searches a lot of trademark searches a lot of you know domain availability searches app store searches you know is it available or not um, and just to protect yourself for the future too even though you don't have an app you might want to make sure that in the future if you would have an app that that name that you can already you know uh, own it and then it's available um, it, that's I mean that's really it and then how does the name sound right that's the more obvious right and how awkward is it for you to answer the phone and say that name or in conversation to say that name you know does it does it does it flow well you know does it feel does it paint the right picture from the get-go like do you feel like this this sounds like the company that you want to be um so art and science for sure um one of the things that you write about in bigger than this is the importance of authenticity um, and one of the things that I've, I've seen you do in your writing in a couple of places is you call, you call attention back to the use of words, like even, even words like brand, um, and words like authenticity can sometimes when you come across them can come across as the opposite of authentic. Um, but there is an authentic authenticity in it, and you've, you've brought it up a couple of times about, you know, really meaning something. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about, uh, let's say with your meeting, a meeting a client, how do you, how do you bring them back to that? authenticity that they have and they may have lost or lost connection with in the end it's really it's really talking to them about about what inspired them Right. I mean, that's the big thing. Right. And, and I think it would be the same thing with with, you know, Lean Pub. If you talk about what, you know, like what what inspired you guys, what inspired the founder to actually say we need to start this because, you know, authors need to have a voice or authors need to, you know, fill in the blanks. Right. Whatever that is. But usually those couple of words. You know, that, that's it. That's enough. You know, like those words are enough that you can then build upon and say, OK, so if we would if we would create an advertising campaign, what would it be? If we if we would be old school at a trade show, what would it be? If we would start an Instagram channel, tell me exactly the the latest six posts, what would the posts be? What would they say? Would they be, you know, animated? Would they be still? Would they be image, you know, focused? Would they be a quote? Would it be your quote? You know, like what, what exactly would go on? And if you only have six of those tiles on an Instagram, 
Instagram channel that you that you start with, what would those six tiles be? And I think it's fascinating because I look at brands' websites and I never get to know the brands as well as if I look at a brand's Instagram channel and I just look at the last six posts because I very quickly understand who they talk to, how they talk, you know, like what the language is like, you know, if they're a giving brand or a taking brand, right? If they're if they're a leadership brand that talks down on you and you're like, yes, you know, give me more of that information. Or if they're a brand that just you, you want to admire them, you know, for for, you know, like that brand is exactly how I want to be or what I want to aspire to. Um, or if it's a brand that just high fives you and you're like, Oh man, I gotta I gotta talk to them, right? So it's amazing. Of, of just a couple of tiles on on Instagram, you immediately get a good idea of, of 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 what that brand is, and and it's good for me too to actually think about my own channel, right? And and for everyone to kind of like go back to it at times, and every couple months look at what what they push out there and say, is this really going down to why I started what I'm doing? Like, do I want to be that leadership brand, or do I want to be seen like that? Um, so I think it's a good exercise. That sounds like a great exercise. I'm uh, I'm going to go check my last six tweets uh, after we, our conversation and see what kind of a person I really am. I, we all will. We all will. Yeah. I, I think that uh, people who are listening to this right now are, are just going through the Insta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one thing one thing you write about that struck me was the importance of adopting a social cause. Um, and we we have a maybe you don't know this, but we have a Lean Pub for Causes program where um, uh, nonprofits can sign up and then authors can share royalties with them. Um, and it hasn't necessarily been the most successful thing, but it, it's one of my favorite parts of LeanPub. It makes me as a, you know, sort of co-founder feel good about what I'm doing. And it, it, it helps authors feel good about what they're doing as well. Um, so I had a little bit of personal experience with that, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, how it can be so important for a company to adopt a social cause, like uh, say, you know, every time someone buys a pair of shoes from you, you give someone, you donate a pair of shoes. Yeah, I could talk about this for the next five hours. So I'm going to try to be very uh, concise with, 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 with everything you just said. So, so first of all, with Lean Pub, um, I was aware of that. And I, it's, it's interesting because I don't use it myself, but from a brand perspective, it resonated with me. So even though I'm not making use of it, I feel like it's great that you guys do this, and it, you know, and and it's just wonderful that that the brand stands for that and stands behind um, an author's uh, an author's choice of uh, of you know of, of of giving back to mankind. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing, like you said, where it doesn't really work as well as you guys want it to work. Like not as many people actually utilize it, but. From a brand perspective, it doesn't matter at all because it matters that you as a co-founder feel strong about you guys doing that. And me as an author, even though I also did not opt in, I feel like it is it is a great thing that, that you're doing. And, and that is kind of a really nice way of seeing how brands how brands resonate with people where it's it's a bunch of these it's a bunch of these layers and they're not all social responsibility right it's like user experience right with lean pub super important right and then there's the social responsibility part and then there's um you know there's a delight part where where you know the emails are fun or or great or it's or it's educative like you do with the podcast or but it's it's like all of these layers when they come together they form a brand um and i think that's what that's what that's what today's brands do very very well where they understand it's not just like Tom's example, the one for one, you know, or Warby Parker, where, you know, like it's it's called the BOGO movement, the buy one, give one movement. Right. Um, which is which is seeing a lot of backlash, too, because it doesn't feel very authentic. It just feels like any startup can have a mediocre product and get away with it if they give away one to some cost that is somewhat you know, not even related to their product, right? And, and I, it's kind of like greenwashing. It's very much like that, where I see a lot of backlash with that. Now, that being said, what Tom's has been doing is, was amazing, right? And the same thing with Warby Parker. And it's just that now it becomes this thing where startup entrepreneurs just feel like, oh, that's super easy. Let's cling ourselves, let's attach ourselves to some sort of cause and and things will you know we're going to sell product because people care about causes and it's not quite that easy right it has to be it has to be a cause that really really makes sense with the product that you're selling right so it has to be 
um, an example that that I give in the book um, is Bombas. It's a it's a sock company. They're called Bombas. Um, and what they do is they do that same old model, the one for one model. And, and 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 I'm already so over that idea of one for one because it just seems like such a trick. But what they do is they re, they realize that socks are the number one requested uh, item in homeless shelters. So they realize that homeless never get fresh socks because you and I can't go to um, to to a Goodwill or a Salvation Army or you know any any donation place and give our used socks to them, right? Or even buy new ones and drop them off there. They're not allowed to accept socks, and so. Bombas realized, well, let's create really good, sturdy socks so that homeless can wear them and that, that it really, you know, that because homeless spend, you know, day and night in, in, in socks, right? So for them, it has to be really great socks. Um, and we're going to give a pair to, to homeless. Every time you buy a pair, we give a pair to, to homeless shelters um, because we can because they're fresh and they come from the factory, right? And so to me, that is a perfect case where I say, you know what, there's a real cause, a cause that they actually identified that has really to do one-to-one with the product that they sell. And it makes me as a customer believe that these socks are actually good because, if, you know, because if, if they have to stand the test of time with homeless, they're going to be good for me too. It's going to be good quality and I'm doing good. So when I buy socks next time, maybe I go with Bombas because the story just makes so much sense for me. And and in this book, um, in my new book, Bigger Than This, I talk a lot about that, how there's companies out there now that, 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 really resonate with people but they have commodity products there's really nothing new i mean it's just it's just socks right i mean there's no i i don't know how much innovation is in their socks right i mean maybe they're a little sturdier but in the end it's just socks but it resonates because of a story and and the story is much deeper than the actual product yeah that was one of the things i um uh quite enjoyed about about your book is how you you invoke the idea that you know uh with with the with when you're trying to build a brand around commodities uh, it's a much more, in, in some ways, it, it, if I'm getting this right, it's a much more interesting challenge to think about than one where you're writing about, say, a, a unique, a unique new product or startup. That's right. I mean, a, a commodity has absolutely no differentiator. So for them, for for the ones that do it right, their differentiator is is brand thinking. You know, it's, it's brand strategy, and that's so cool because most entrepreneurs know nothing about branding right they know nothing about brand strategy and they just intrinsically say like well this is what we stand for and this is what we do and and you know it's my business to actually infuse them with these with these thoughts but these some of these commodity brands they just do it themselves and they totally nail it and for me as a brand strategist that's you know that's super exciting because like you said if if i get hired by another silicon valley tech startup which which i love and i love working with them but it makes my life easier because they have huge differentiators you know they immediately make life easier for a very certain you know um thing right you, you this is there's this one thing that's just going to be that much easier based on this one app or based on this one invention and it's innovative it's disruptive it's interesting but socks you know like that's a hard story to to, to tell right yeah yeah um but you told it you told it very well um uh moving <laughs> Moving on, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience uh, as an as an author. Um, you know, many of the listeners to this podcast are themselves um, self published authors, um, and as as much as everyone understands the importance of branding and personal branding and marketing, it can be hard to successfully do it. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your approach to uh, marketing your latest book, Bigger Than This. Oh, boy. Book marketing. You know, so I'm not in the business of book marketing. And even though I feel like after this release, I could I could slowly move into that. Uh, but it's 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 difficult. Right. I mean, everyone listening um, who is an author on Lean Pub, they, they know it. Right. Um, you know, it's in order to get on bestseller list, you got to move 3000, 5000 books a day. You know, I mean, it's it's it's, it's really to market it in order for you to to have a huge success with your book it's difficult so it's very much like what they call in uh, in advertising a, a drip campaign where it's one small step at a time right it's like drip 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 it's like a little bit here a little bit there a little bit here across a lot of channels and you just do it over a long period of time and so um i mean we went pretty 
pretty all out with 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 my book, you know, trying to go across all social media channels. And um, I hired a PR agency for 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 a fairly hefty amount uh, of money um, to make sure that they can help me with it. And the thing that if I would if I would give one tip, I think the thing that really helped my book, and it's just been released last week, so it's it's way too early to to talk about this. Um, is something that I got from uh, from my editor. For this book, I actually hired an editor. So for my first book, I didn't. But for this book, I said, you know what? I'm going to hire an editor that has expertise in my field. So I hired uh, the former editor of, uh, of Fortune Small Business. So she knows small businesses. She knows branding. She understands it. Um, to go over my book and kind of like work with me once the book has been written to, to kind of like make sure that everything flows nicely, that everything makes sense. And she gave me that market tip uh, at the very end and she said Fabian you should really include a couple of other books in the back of your book that you recommend as further reading and I'm like as a, as a consultant, I'm like, God, no, you know, here, here I spend so much time and then money and effort in writing my own book. I want everyone to hire me, right? Like I, I want someone to read my book and afterwards say, well, this was inspiring. And, oh, I do have marketing money. And, oh, my God, let me hire Fabian to redo my branding, right? But she said, look, this is the wrong thinking. It's like it's really about when people finish the book, they already love you at this point or they hate you, right? But but either way, like they're already, like you're either friends or enemies at that point um, forever. Um, now give them a chance to, to, to read other books that are in, inspirational. And how that turned into marketing is that she said, look, contact these people contact these big authors, right? Um, and, and tell them you, you have their book in your book. Like you recommend their book at the end of your book as further reading. Would they be willing or interested in uh, quickly reviewing your book and uh, maybe endorsing it? And so I would have never had the guts as a self-published author to, you know, call up, you know, <laughs> call up all these big names, you know, um, and say, hey, you know, would you would you want to endorse my book? But she kind of like she gave me this she gave me this um, this idea and and I did. And, you know, I mean, now I got some amazing endorsements, you know, Jonah Berger of, you know, Contagious and like, you know, like big, big marketing, you know, authors, you know, co-founder of Fast Company endorsed my book. And I would have never in a million years thought about it. But it's kind of cool because you say, look, I have you in my book. Would you would you kind of not to return the favor, but but it kind of helps you as an in. Right. And I think that's a huge trick. I, I believe that out of all the marketing, all the dollars I spend, everything I've done, having those quotes, you know, of these people on my book is a huge thing. Uh, th uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for thanks for that. Specific and excellent tip. I've never I've never heard that one before. Um, but uh, that's it, it's, it's really hard to come across true gems like that. Um, so yeah, if, for everyone listening, uh, t t take a, take a leaf out of, out of, uh, Fabian's book there. That's a, that's a really good idea. Um, uh, we're approaching probably about the time when we should wrap things up. Um, but, uh, my, my last question in these interviews is always a selfish one, which is, um, in, in a way, which is, um, if there were one thing we could build for you or one thing we could fix for you on lean pub, what would you ask us to do? Well, um, first of all, I think, I mean, Lean Pub does what I wanted to do really, really well. Um, and, and, and to me, the key for Lean Pub uh, is coupons, which I don't know if that's at all something that you hear often. But for me, it's amazing, like the idea of how easily I can give someone a book and know that it will only be used once and know that it's, uh, you know, that, that it's a very easy process for them, whatever device they're on. So, so, so the coupons is something that I use, I use a lot, uh, for lean pub. Um, one thing, it's the smallest thing to improve. Uh, and it's, I, I mean, it's really ridiculous because it's, it's, it's all depending on screen size and, you know, like what, what exactly you're on. But I always feel that, on the actual book website, so not on an author site, but on the book website, um, on the landing page of the book, I always feel that the details of the book, you kind of don't see them. Like if you're if you're in a regular laptop 
type screen, you know, like it, it happens that where the gray area starts and, and if you have a video, the video is the first thing, right? And otherwise it's a description. Um, I have a hard time seeing that description, you know, like it feels to me like the book kind of the, the book ends there and I either have the sample that I can get into or I can uh, I can, you know, look at the table of contents. But that's something where I feel like if maybe on the left hand side um, of the book cover, you would start a little bit or you would have like already the video or you would start digging into it a little bit. And again, I'm not talking about mobile devices. I'm talking about very specific screen sizes, but do a little test with that. And if I'm not the only one, then maybe it's something where if you can start in the left column to utilize it so that you get people to scroll down so that they see that there's more, I think it might be cool. Uh, thanks very much for that really specific feedback. That's um that's excellent, and it's something I'll definitely um think about and share with our team. I mean, it it just struck me right away. Uh, we we sort of hide the about the book information below the fold, um, and you don't even necessarily know that it's going to be waiting for you down there. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely think about that. Um, well, thanks thanks very much, uh, Fabian, for taking the time to do this. I really enjoyed the conversation, uh, and it's given me a couple of things to go and weigh and think about. Uh, so thanks very much for that. And for everyone listening, please pick up a copy of uh, Bigger Than This. Thank you, then. Really enjoyed it. This was great. Thanks.